welcome to today's webinar, How IX Leaders Look at Data. Um, thank you for joining us, and I hope you're all well and participating from the safety of your own home. My name is Tori Penrod Cambra. I'm a co founder and CMO at HiBite, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. And um, I'd like to start this off by introducing you to our two speakers and then briefly running through today's agenda. Matt, will you go ahead and go to the next slide, please? Sure. So we're um, lucky to have with us today Matt Littlefield, who's the president of LNS Research. Um, he co-founded the company in 2011. And before co-founding LNS, Matt spent five years at the Aberdeen Group, where he led the company's manufacturing research practice. Prior to Aberdeen, Matt spent six years working in operations for leading manufacturers. Matt holds a BA in economics and an MS in industrial engineering and operations research. He's going to take us through um, about 30 minutes today covering um, industrial transformation and research that LNS has recently completed. So you'll get to see uh, some of that data that's just hot off the press, which is great. And our second speaker is my colleague and fellow co-founder of HiBite, John Harrington. John's passionate about delivering technology that improves productivity and safety in manufacturing and industrial environments. He spent his 25 year career, both delivering software to manufacturers and working for manufacturers in operations role. Uh, so a pretty unique perspective. And that experience, him, experience has given him a viewpoint on how both suppliers and end users play an integral role in implementing new solutions. John has an MBA from Babson College and a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from WPI. Um, so just a couple pieces of housekeeping before we jump into Matt's great content and most recent research. Um, Matt will cover some topics for 30 minutes and then John will give an overview of um, HiBytes data ops solution for 15 minutes and then we're going to try to spend as much time as we can for open Q&A. Um, you have the chat functionality, feel free to use it. We'll probably save questions for the end. Um, obviously, if there's a technical issue, you can let me know through chat as well. And otherwise, we'll save questions for the end and, and hopefully get into some good discussion then. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we will make the recording available afterwards. And we'll also be sharing with you a research spotlight, um, which was written by LNS Research that dives deeper into some of the topics that we'll cover today. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Matt. Thanks, Tori. Um, can you hear me all right? coming through okay all right well thank you and welcome everyone it's, it's a pleasure to be here today this is uh this is my second webcast since uh since we've all started sheltering in place and, and working from home so i hope i uh, hope everyone's home and safe as tori mentioned uh I, I i'm co-working with both a one and a half year old and three and a half year old so they pretty much learned over the past month not to come in when, when dad's on a call but uh we'll see this will be a dynamic situation we'll try and be agile with it uh, so I'm going to first uh, introduce LNS a little bit pretty quickly and then dive into the research as, as Tori said. Um, our mission and vision at LNS is evangelizing and driving industrial transformation. We'll be sharing some of our most uh, recent research on the topic today uh, from our, our new study on analytics that matter. Uh, so, so one of the things that came out and a little bit of a tagline I've been working on is that transformation really does require both good data and good culture. And, and those things you might not think are intertwined, but, but this research really does show they are intertwined. And so we'll get into those, those different aspects and hopefully give you some real, real insights, real recommendations that you can take back to your business. And uh, you know, John will, will follow up with me on, on some really important uh, areas that, that uh, HiBite can also help. So I will start with some trends on industrial transformation. I'll dive into how the leaders in transformation, or IX, so that's our own little tagline for industrial transformation IX, uh, look, look at data differently. I'll examine uh, some of the trends around ITOT convergence, a very important and challenging topic for many companies, and then end with those, those recommendations. So here's the, uh, here's the analyst team. Uh, we're all uh, a group of incredibly good looking guys, uh, but we know industrial transformation even better uh, than how, how good looking we are. And so we cover a number of topics like factor of the future, uh, asset performance management, health and safety, quality, uh, sustainability, as well as a number of horizontal technology topics, uh, things like cloud edge, uh, industrial IoT platforms, uh, connected worker platforms, no code, low code platforms, as well as cyber 
and uh, today's important topic, which is uh, data contextualization and conditioning. Uh, so we see that as an emer emerging and important piece of the overall stack and architecture. And then we also do look into how industrial transformation, so that factory or that uh, productive asset touches other, other areas of the business in the value chain, right? So that could be connected assets and the customer experience, the service experience, and then also uh, upstream to things like R&D and innovation. Uh, they're all connected and all important to delivering uh, value to the customer through transformation. And we have a membership-based model uh, really targeting those transformation leaders, quality leaders, environment, health, and safety leaders, uh, operational leaders. And here are a sampling of the companies that, uh, that have worked with us over the years as members. So we run a number of events uh, for the membership as well as provide access to the analyst team and research. And there's a number of both uh, peer networking and, and benchmarking opportunities for these companies through the, uh, through the analyst team. So starting to get into the research. Uh, so this data I'll be sharing today uh, was connect, collected over the past several months, uh, mainly through December uh, and January of this year. A little bit of data came in in February as well. So, so really pretty hot off the press uh, and the analysis is fresh. So uh, this is really some new analysis that has not been uh, has not been published yet. So that's pretty exciting. It will be published over the next uh, uh, coming days with some that's already out in the uh, uh, research spot that you get after this. But as you can see, we do try and control and balance our our demographics, we want to have a good split across discrete process and batch. Uh, we do bias a little bit towards North America, so about half of the respondents in North America, uh, a little bit over a quarter from Europe, and then we split across Asia, mainly China, and the uh, rest of the world. So we translate the survey both into German and uh, simplified Chinese along with English. And again, we try and balance the split of uh, revenue by small, medium, and large companies. So what are some of those really important industrial transformation trends really to set the context for today's, today's talk? Uh, when we talk about industrial transformation, we see it as a, a proactive and coordinated approach to creating step change improvements across the value chain. So there's some important takeaways there. You know, over the last couple of years, the biggest buzzword out there has been digital transformation. Uh, we see industrial transformation as an important and differentiated subset of the broader digital transformation world, right? You digitally transform anything, a bank, a media company. We focus on those discrete batch and process industries, the productive industries. It touches all aspects of the value chain. So from R&D through manufacturing, supply chain, and the end customer. And then there's a number of emerging technologies. Uh, if you go back five or six years, uh, IoT and the emerging industrial IoT were, uh, one of the top buzzwords, you know, there has been growth in that space, but one of the things that has emerged is that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship where IoT equals industrial transformation. Yes, those trends are still happening around the IoT where there's more and more connected products and assets, cars and homes, right? There's more connectivity, compute and storage is coming down in cost, sensors and other technologies coming down in cost in terms of connectivity. So yes, there's more data. Yes, there's more opportunity to analyze and, and monetize that data. But there's lots of other technologies that are part of transformation. We'll talk through some of those. So here's our industrial transformation framework. We've been working off this framework for about five years now. Uh, we still see it as highly relevant and uh, important to guide both how we engage with companies and how companies should think about their own transformation. So we, we think about it as five interconnected and uh, ongoing swim lanes. So at the highest level, you have the business objective, typically coming from the CEO uh, or other senior execs saying, hey, here's, here's the, uh, what we're trying to, to achieve as a company, right? So this is where you set the vision and mission. This is where you set some of those highest level metrics. Uh, it could be around cost, it could be around growth, profitability, et cetera, but really setting that high level of vision and performance metrics. The strategic initiatives are uh, what drives performance improvement. It's what drives and supports those business objectives. So things like industrial transformation would certainly be one of the strategic initiatives, you know, we did some industrial transformation readiness work uh, a few years ago, uh, about a year ago. And, uh, you know, we saw on average these um, transformation initiatives have about, you know, 10 sub programs. So th these are pretty broad based initiatives touching lots of different parts of the business. And that's where you start thinking about realigning people, process and technology. The piece in the middle there is operational architecture. So that's where you start thinking about ITOT convergence. So IT groups have typically typically had an architecture function, enterprise architecture role, doesn't always get down into OT and operations. Uh, so we think companies need a proactive and uh, dedicated approach to bring those two groups 
and architectures together into one. Uh, solution selection is uh, really understanding, hey, what are the options out there for technology? How does it fit into my architecture, support my strategic initiatives, and ultimately, and hopefully, drive uh, maturity improvement? And how do you manage that change? So we have maturity models uh, there across all of our major research areas. We also see common challenges and gaps across those, um, across those swim lanes. Uh, so we listed some of those there, and we do deep research and uh, sprints to support on all of those. And then we, we think it's important that there are feedback loops uh, between these different processes because they're often owned by, they often, often have different owners. Finally, I, I think just talking about maturity of the industry, most companies today have figured out the why and the what. Uh, so industrial transformation is broad based. I don't think I included it in this deck, but we're seeing almost 80% of companies either having some type of industrial transformation initiative, you know, industry 4.0, smart manufacturing, et cetera, back to the future, or, um, you're planning to, to start it this year in 2020. So those, those business cases are, are largely set. Uh, there's been a lot of work over the, about the past five years on hey, what is industry 4.0? What is smart manufacturing, right? And so a lot of that definitional pieces have been done. Uh, so it's been a lot of hard work to get where we are. But now most companies are in the how, right? So I've ran my pilots, my proof of concepts. I've, I've got some feedback. And now okay, I've got 100 plants, I've got 20 plants, I've got five plants, one plant. How do I take what I did in one plant or one line and roll it across? So that's where most companies are now, how to actually uh, build and sustain the change. We hear a lot about pull and momentum. That, that's what most companies are thinking about. So as I, as I go through the, the analysis today, uh, I will be referring to IX leaders uh, quite a bit. Uh, that, that's, when we talk about an industrial transformation leader, it's a self-assessed self through the survey. So these are the companies that, hey, we set these goals and we achieve these goals, right? We, we either declare the initiative a, a real success or hey, we are making demonstrable progress on that and really feel good about the initiative, right? These are still pretty new, so it's not like everyone's achieved the full $300 million business case, but they're on the path that they set. And so we see about, depending on the survey, 25 to 30%, in this case it's 28%, of, uh, of companies actually achieving success. Uh, so important part there is, is there's a lot of risk here. There's a lot of companies that have not gotten off to the fast start that they were hoping to with transformation. Uh, so it doesn't mean that the initiatives are dead. We're, we are seeing some initiatives get, get killed. But in general, they're still, uh, they're still going, but uh, often it's taking more investment um, and more work than they, than they originally thought. So quick wins is not, uh, not what we're seeing in terms of scaling. It, it's really about hard work over sustained periods of time to deliver the value. So some interesting uh, high level results from this study where we really looked at some of those analytics and goal setting and what type of benefits companies are, are achieving. So when we looked at those IX leaders, uh, they're still going for double digit improvements. We hear that a lot uh, from, from different uh, companies. We want, to, we want double digit improvements. You know, we don't want our traditional one, two, 3% continuous improvement a year. We want to get 10, 20, 30, 40% improvements in key metrics like productivity or cost or quality, et cetera, safety. Uh, but we are seeing a difference. The IX leaders on average are going for 16% improvement where the IX followers are going for 29, 30% improvement. Uh, and that's, that's a big difference. Um, and so the leaders are setting smaller goals, uh, really in that 15% range. And I just pulled one slide here in terms uh, one data point in terms of the number of different technologies that they're, they're looking at, but the result is true across both process and organizational investments is that the IX leaders and you'll see as we go are investing much more. So they're, they're setting smaller goals and making, making larger investments. Uh, and again, going back to some of that readiness research we did earlier in the year or last year. Uh, we talked about one of the failure modes as, as zombie programs. So even though they're making much larger investments than the followers, they're typically in line with that business case. So if you have a $300 million business case, you really think you're going to achieve that. You, you have quite a bit of, bit of room to play with in terms of investments. Um, and they're making commensurate investments where the followers are setting even higher goals uh, and really under, under investing in those goals. Um, so some important points there on both goal setting and, uh, and, and how well you can achieve those goals by, and through, through the investments you make. One other interesting point uh, in terms of all those technologies, there's just one technology that, that followers were more likely to be focused on, 
and that was uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So it is important. There's a lot of hype around it right now, but it is not a panacea. It's also not instant results. Um, all of these artificial intelligence systems, you know, take a lot of training and learning um, to actually become expert systems. You know, I've always, I, I, not to pick on IBM, but you know, the, uh, if you've ever worked with, uh, with uh, their Watson AI platform, and we have a number of clients who do, uh, right, you, you, get the, you get the joke that it's, uh, you know, Watson's still a seven-year-old petulant child, right? It's, uh, there's a lot of value there, but, uh, you know, the, these are not panaceas, and you have to train these, you have to train these systems. So uh, just an interesting aside. All right, so let's jump into uh, IX leaders and, and how they look at data differently. So this is our industrial transformation reference architecture. It is a set of capabilities, uh, not, a, not a true architecture, about, um, about the technologies that are next gen and needed to drive, to drive transformation. And so we, about five years ago, were the first analyst firm to define the industrial IoT platform, put that definition out there. Uh, so a lot of adoption and use of that across industries. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we see transformation really is more than the industrial IoT. We just see that as a part of that, you know, and, and we see a convergence of these platforms around trans, uh, enabling technologies of transformation. So that would include things like no code and low code platforms, um, connected worker platforms, AR, VR platforms, AI and machine learning, really all built into that, that platform, not just, hey, we're gonna connect to uh, uh, devices broadly. So that's one of the big changes. Um, another piece, uh, there's a lot of confusion on premise edge and cloud, right? Uh, a lot of whitewashing around edge where, hey, hey, I have a 20 year old on premise system uh, or software and I'm, I'm gonna relabel it edge. You know, when we say edge, we really mean cloud native edge where I can take a cloud native app and run it in the cloud or on the edge. Uh, so it's not just relabeling on premise software. So be careful there. And then, especially for today's conversation, uh, data conditioning and contextualization, we see that as a important um, new piece of the architecture. And in some cases, the infrastructure of platform providers uh, deliver some of these capabilities. In, in many cases, they're, they're not sufficient. We see uh, pure play providers stepping in to deliver some of these capabilities. We'll talk, uh, talk about how that, how that makes a difference. And here, here is then translating that set of capabilities into what we see as an operational architecture, which has both the traditional data sources plus the new industrial IoT enabled data sources plus external data sources, suppliers, customers, et cetera, coming into that green box, just the industrial data connectivity and data model, uh, where you have multiple types of data living, uh, hopefully being contextualized, and then going to multiple sources, uh, another important point here, or a few, is we are seeing uh, many companies going with a multi-data lake strategy where, hey, maybe originally they, they just had one data lake for everything, but then they quickly realized it's probably too unstructured, too unwieldy. And so maybe we have, we were just talking to a large CPG company yesterday, they have a supply chain transformation data lake. And so operations and quality and supply chain are a big part of that, but all their customer data might be somewhere else. So multiple data lakes. And then also the emergence of self-service analytics that can be easily deploy, uh, deployed as SaaS applications. So we're seeing that both at the enterprise level uh, with, with, uh, with self-service, you hear a lot about the citizen data scientist, but then also a lot at the, uh, in the OT world, right? With uh, uh, analytics that are specifically designed for uh, time series data uh, as an example. And so you can quickly see that as as you have more and more consumers of data and more and more sources of data, if these are all done through point-to-point -point connections or through mappings, it can, you could very easily build an architecture that is, uh, that is fragile, that is hard to maintain and costly to maintain over time. And that's, that's the value of an abstraction layer uh, and, and providing context to that data. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the architecture, why it's important to think architecturally and the importance of some abstraction and contextualization around data sources uh, from operations. And now let's, let's dig in, hey, how are those IX leaders doing this differently? So one is just, hey, have the IX leaders cr uh, created some type of data model there, right? Does, does that green box exist? And, uh, you know, it was over double. Uh, the likelihood. So very strong correlation between leaders and the creation of this data model. 
Similarly, we look to companies that, hey, do you have an analytics program uh, that includes operations or, or do you not? And, and even a higher correlation. Uh, so that's one of the insights here is that if you're interested in analytics, you're going to need this type of data contextualization. Those analytics will not have the data quality, the richness that you, that you think you're going to get if you don't do this work. Uh, so a lot of companies don't discover that until two years after they're down their challenged analytics journey. Uh, so I think that's a learning for some companies that maybe have aspirations around AI or machine learning. Uh, you, you really need to do some investments here early, uh, rather, earlier rather than later, because uh, you're going to do it anyways, and uh, might as well get that value quicker. Another very interesting result that came out of the research here in terms of how these, uh, uh, this, this data approach delivers value, um, the leaders, which are much more likely to use these data models, are also much more likely to be um, collecting many different types of data, especially data outside of manufacturing, so including those traditional machine data, quality data, production performance data, et cetera, but then, hey, supplier data, financial data, HR data, also more likely to be included. And then bringing that together and delivering it to decision makers. So not just shop floor decision makers, but VPs across many different roles, or right? even senior executives that are going to want to be able to bring these different data sources together quickly, answer the questions that they want to answer and the tools that they want to answer uh, to use to analyze the data. Uh, they have that flexibility and ability. And so that's what, that's what the, uh, uh, the IX leaders are doing. More data sources, more data consumers with context. So ITOT convergence, I made the, made the claim earlier, right, that uh, uh, transformation requires both good data and good culture. And, and this is where a lot of that comes together. So we did look at who, who's kind of like the, a little bit of a who's on first analysis, right? So um, we looked at who's leading this charge on the data model side and who's responsible for the analytics program. And we actually found that um, it's not the same, same role or even organization within the company. So analytics programs for leaders are more likely to be driven by the CIO. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, CIOs have owned BI initiatives for decades now. Uh, those have expanded in many different directions. Uh, and you know, they, have, they have some serious chops in terms of understanding the analytics landscape uh, and understanding how to engage with and partner with business leaders to ensure that they're delivering value. But they're not necessarily the right role, at least from the leader's perspective, to drive that data abstraction layer and data model. Uh, and that is being left to the data experts and the data science teams to actually deliver and design that data model. And uh, I think that's a really important distinction. And one of the challenges that we see is in the companies where IT does lead the development of that data model, uh, traditionally it's a very um, top-down master data management type approach, kind of using the tool set that you know, uh, which is very common within IT, having been used to deploy things like ERP systems and other enterprise applications. So when you take that approach, um, you, know, you just define all the different types of templates and permutations of the data uh, and really try and create this uh, relatively early on exhaustive uh, model. And in many cases, it ends up collapsing under its own weight, not delivering value fast enough, uh, and, and really causes some challenges for folks. The data science world, the digital world, is, is much more likely to have adopted agile tools and methodologies and say, hey, let's, let's, this is one of the risks. Sometimes the data scientists, especially if they haven't engaged with operations much, say, hey, we want all the data and we'll find the correlations, not the right approach. If they're smart about it and do an agile approach and bring in subject matter experts, they'll say, let's identify a few high priority use cases. Let's bring in the data sources that we know are um, critical for that use case, uh, because this is not Greenfield, right? We've been running these plants for decades. We know what data is generally important. And then let's slowly bring in and test new data sources as hypotheses emerge where we want to test things. Uh, and deliver value and then expand the data sources, expand the use cases over time. So have a structure and a framework to bring on more data sources over time, but not try and predefine that all, all up front. So some pretty important insights there on, on who should do what uh, in terms of both the abstraction layer versus uh, the analytics program. The, the other piece here is, um, is data ops and uh, focusing that on these industrial sources. 
So data ops is a uh, emerging methodology. And um, you know, this comes from, I, I gave the Wikipedia source here. There's also a data ops manifesto that's out there. Uh, good resources for what data ops is. It's essentially bringing together agile, lean, and DevOps into a holistic program for reorganization in some of the ways I just described. We do see that um, you know, leaders are, are embracing these data ops methodologies uh, at, at a very significant rate. So again, highly correlated. And, and we see this data ops process as the key for ensuring that you know, your, 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 your IT team and data science team who are defining your analytics program <clears throat> and your, your, your data model don't go off the rails, don't go crazy, don't build a whole bunch of things that don't deliver value to the customer. And the customer being your operational leaders, your value chain leaders, um, and ultimately your customers, right? The, the, the customers of the final product that the firm's um, I'm building for. So it's a really important part, piece of that puzzle to make sure that, that the data science teams and the IT teams are focused on, on delivering the item. Uh, this is another kind of peeking around the corner and hopefully avoiding some uh, future challenges. Uh, so data governance is a big challenge for a lot of companies, especially when they, they, they launch a data lake. Uh, so what, what happens, especially if there isn't some type of formal data ops process, companies do what I just said you shouldn't do. Uh, they collect as much data as possible. Everybody's sort of throwing it into the data lake. Maybe there isn't even data science involved. You know, maybe there's the, there's IT partners with business partners. The IT guy says, hey, what data do you have? What data do you think would be valuable? We give it to the business person, gives it to the IT counterpart, and it starts all building up in, in a data lake, getting larger and larger, uh, and harder and harder to pull pull value out, pull data, pull, pull value out, have contextualization of what's in there. So most companies don't necessarily say, throw the data lake away after two years of pain. They say, let's, let's govern this thing. Let's get some structure. And so the IX leaders are more likely to put some structure in there. Um, this is a, a rough model of what we see generally working. Uh, I've seen this example at, at Whirlpool work really well. One of our long-term clients, uh, Air Liquide as well, uh, has a very similar structure. And so that structure is having a um, cross-functional, and this is a business uh, functions, uh, saying what are those important data sources? What should be allowed into that, that data lake? So it's not a free-for-all, not every piece of data gets in there. Uh, there is a structured process and set of leaders who define what's, what's in there. And then there's a very focused effort on, on data quality and pushing, pushing data quality as close to uh, the source of that data as possible with, it, with a defined data owner. So multiple layers of data ownership at the corporate functional and site level is, is a common way, but you, you could do it in a way that maps to your organization. But really having those multiple data owners and in some cases even, in, even creating new data specific roles. So we, we've seen the emergence of the data engineer right coming about uh, data wrangler some companies uh, call them and all uh, right so this is down at that functional or site level data owner and uh, often it's just uh, you know the existing um, not process engineers but process automation folks who are the owners of that process automation system which can be a data source making sure that's providing high quality data up to the rest of the organization and then hopefully in a contextualized way we have that abstraction layer uh, in place so last uh, slide before I get into recommendations, uh, creating a positive culture. You know, I love Drucker's uh, co uh, quote on, uh, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You can have as many fancy frameworks as you want. If you, if you have poor culture, uh, you're not going to be able to execute on that. If you haven't seen Edgar Sheen's uh, uh, culture work, uh, I highly recommend it. He's a professor emeritus at uh, MIT Sloan. He just produced some new work uh, very recently, actually with his son, on culture around transformation. I like, I'm more of a, uh, a classics kind of guy. I like his seminal original work from 84. And, and essentially it defines culture as uh, it's based on uh, those basic assumptions that the organization has. These are the things that are taken for granted, invisible and pre-conscious. Uh, and that's what drives an organization's values. And that's what uh, ultimately creates the artifacts um, and uh, work of that organization. Probably butchered it, read it yourself, but that's, that's my high level takeaway. Uh, so why does OT and IT have so much trouble? It's because they have different 
basic assumptions. And so here are some uh, five recommendations here on culture specifically, and we have a whole sprint on these uh, to help you think through how better to manage your culture and hopefully get to that shared set of, of basic assumptions. So culture change really starts with understanding and valuing those differences. Um, so, you know, IT works in a certain way, and OT works in a certain way because of how they've evolved, because of the requir business requirements that have been placed on them, right? So OT, right, you think problem solvers, uh, really, right, keeping the plant running, getting product out the door, et cetera, et cetera. IT, right, it's more about uh, the cost of the system, sustainability of the system, privacy and security of the system. So it's different values, different uh, goals. Uh, so understanding those and recognizing that you each have, uh, there's importance in each, and uh, that is an important way to help get folks together. Data science and engineering, that's also, also another uh, common conflict, right, where the data science understands data, doesn't understand the process. The engineer understands the process, you know, may have some statistical experience, probably not data science experience, uh, but getting them to value each and work together, their strengths is important. There's a similar, similar angle on security. So, so having some time spent exercises to bring those, those common uh, understanding of differences out is, is a good approach. Uh, clearly defined roles and responsibilities. This is, this is a critical one. So often when I see companies saying, hey, I, you know, I need help with ITO deconvergence, often there's some type of, type of perceived from one side or the other, uh, land grab, turf war, uh, et cetera. And so that means, that means that there's not clearly defined roles, right? I, I think of the football team analogy. I'm up here in Boston, right? So you got Belichick always talking about the three phases of the game, right? You got offense, defense, special teams. We should know which team they're on. Um, and then part of that larger team going towards one goal. And uh, not everyone doesn't always, always get that in this ITOT piece. If you get some of that work done, right, common goals and priorities, uh, for both groups coming together is important, right? And so this should support some of the, that strategic initiative work that we talked about earlier, business, uh, business objectives, et cetera. So cost, risk, performance, all common. Goals you can focus on. Another way to help get that shared uh, mindset is a shared service mindset. So hey, the you know, OT is not operations, right? And uh, this is often a point of confusion. OT is, is a technical person, right? It, I own the automation system or you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, the advanced manufacturing person that owns the CNC machine or looking at additive manufacturing. They're technologists that understand the business, but support, you know, the plant managers or the VP of ops or the folks who really get the product out the door. So in both cases, you're driving to support both an internal customer and then also the, the, the final end customer. And so thinking about it in that mindset helps create this uh, uh, shared service. And then finally, is, um, is proactive cross-training and leadership development. Most successful examples that I come across of ITOT convergence are, are by accident. It's, there's one or a few people who have moved up through the organization over many years and have had multiple roles, sometimes with IT, sometimes with operations or OT. And they have credibility and relationships on both sides. And they can work as a change agent to, to do all those things that I just described. Companies that don't have those people, uh, don't have those relationships, that connected tissue, have a hard time doing, doing some of the things I just talked about. Uh, so I think there's a real opportunity in the industry for companies to get much more proactive in creating those types of people and those types of relationships. So many companies have leadership development programs, high potential programs, but often both IT and engineering or OT are separate. They have very siloed, technically, technical specific tracks. You know, maybe, you know, if I'm an engineer, someday 30 years from now, if I'm a new engineer, I'll be a, a researcher, engineering fellow in my organization. But I've been really on that engineering track. Um, and I think we'll probably see some very similar things evolve around data science as an example. But if you look out, 10 years, right, or 20 years, companies are going to want their business leaders to understand data really well, to understand IT and OT really well, uh, to understand transformation generally really well. Uh, so working some rotations in there, some, some, de some dedicated uh, cross-functional training uh, or moving people, uh, I think can really help some companies. 
And uh, so working with the uh, talent management functions and groups uh, to understand this and build this in, uh, I think can really help IPOT conversions. So some thoughts there on, on culture. So some final recommendations I'll pass to John. Uh, you really taking that uh, architectural approach and making sure that abstraction layer, that data model is prominently featured. Because uh, if you don't think about it early, you're going to end up thinking about it later, two years from now, when you have all sorts of problems. Uh, really thinking about the business case for the data model is it is foundational and can be built upon a successful transformation initiative and successful analytics programs. Um, we really see this emerging data ops organization as a critical part of the uh, cross-functional team driving transformation uh, and, and should be prominently featured. Uh, and then everything I just mentioned on culture. Remember, remember the culture is strategy for practice. So hopefully there's some, uh, some good insight in there for you. Um, I enjoyed the opportunity to share that with you and uh, I'll pass to John and uh, look forward to your questions. Thanks, Matt. That was great. Um, in fact, it's, it's going to be interesting. I'm going to build off of a lot of Matt's uh, research and um, you know, the, the LNS team and Matt had found a lot of similar uh, research uh, or had done a lot of similar research and found a lot of similar results to what we did um, when we formed HiBite. And you're going to see that a lot of that is utilized in the solution that we've created, the HiBite Intelligence Hub. So I'm going to build on a lot of the concepts that he talked about and explain um, a little bit at, at a level deeper than where he went into where these challenges are and then how we can solve them. Okay, let me start off by introducing HiBite. Um, HiBite was founded in August of 2018 by myself, uh, Tony Payne, who's our Chief Executive Officer, and Tori Penrod Canberra, who's our Head of Marketing. Uh, the three of us have worked together for many years at Kepware and then at PTC after they had acquired Kepware. And we left Informed HiBite in 2018 with a mission of how can we make this industrial data and industri um, much easier to use and much more usable with all these new technologies and new concepts that are coming into uh, the manufacturing space. And the three of us are very focused on the manufacturing space and how can we make manufacturing companies um, much more efficient in the jobs that they perform so that they can perform them at a higher level and be more competitive. So I'm going to build off two key concepts that Matt talked about. One of them is data modeling, conditioning, and contextualization. And the second one is uh, industrial data ops and specifically how that can be applied and what teams, what solutions those data ops teams need in order to be effective in their job. So as we look at the manufacturing technology landscape and how it's evolved from what's often referred to as industry 3.0 in, into what's referred to now as industry 4.0, we see a number of key changes. At the bottom level in the kind of device layer, if you will, we see a lot more PLCs and machine controllers creating data. We see a lot more sensors uh, creating data and, and, and more data being created and more, more ability to control the machinery. And there's a lot more gateways and monitoring equipment out there on the factory floor. So it's much easier to create data and collect data and make use of it. At the same time, we're seeing a huge um, evolution in the number of systems that are looking for the data. As Matt had talked about, there's these new IoT platforms or industrial IoT platforms and analytics platforms. But we're also seeing that a lot of traditional, I'll call them legacy systems, still great systems that companies use to execute their business, are looking for real-time functional um, data from the factory so that they can allow the business professionals that use them to be even more efficient or even more capable in their decision making. So for instance, an asset management system may be adding advanced analytics for predictive, um, predictive failure into the asset management system so that, it, and, and at the same time, they wanna be able to get data from the factory floor. Same time, a quality management system that in the past was just used for managing quality projects now wants real-time data from the factory floor so that they can 
make you so that they can make use of the data and they can maintain that relationship with the quality personnel and provide them real access to real data and and define their quality projects. So what we see is this growth both on the bottom layer and on the top layer of new systems and new uh, data sources. The challenge with that is how do we integrate them? And this is one of the things that Matt had talked about early on. He said one of the challenges that companies have found is how do we deploy all these systems and how do we integrate them? And you know, typically the way that companies would integrate two different systems is they would create a direct link between these two systems. And at the target system where the data is going, they go in and they model up the data, or they, they try to finesse the data as they ingest it so that they can make use of it. And if the systems don't have that ability to do that, then they'll do it in scripting um, just outside of that system so that they can manipulate the data as it gets ingested into these new systems. The challenge with that is that when you go from just adding a single system into many, that just doesn't scale. And it's not only about the systems, it's about, remember, the data sources. We've got many data sources, it's not a single source. So what companies had talked about and what Matt had mentioned is these integrations are not scaling. In fact, I've heard people say that they've had to de-scope their analytics uh, deployments in order to get something out that provides value because they find that the integration is holding them back. Not only is it holding you back, but once you get it done, it also, it also becomes very, it's, it's not very resilient. And it tends to be an ongoing challenge for companies to maintain. This is a problem because in many cases, they had hard coded what all these data transformations are. But those of you who work in manufacturing know that manufacturing plants change over time. Equipment gets replaced, controllers get reprogrammed to optimize the process. And of course, manufacturing companies are constantly changing their product lines and that requires new uh, programming of the lines and, and setup of the lines. So we're not in a static environment. We need to be very agile. And that's where Matt had talked about, we need agile systems in order to deliver these integrations. The other comment that we often hear from people is, the analytics and the visualizations aren't trusted. It's not that the analytics are wrong. It's that when they created the analytic solution, they didn't take into context or into, they, they didn't do it with the knowledge of what's really happening in the factory. For instance, they may run an average over a day and tell you how productive your equipment is, but they didn't factor in the, line, the, the time that the shift was active. So as a result, the production manager has one, um, has one metric and the analyst or the analytic gives you a different metric. And over time, the teams just say, look, we can't trust the data and we can't use it. So we need systems that are really designed and created with an understanding of the data, and we need the data to have that understanding when it's provided. Finally, the, uh, the ops team and the data scientists are reporting back that they're spending a lot of time, spending, they're spending a lot of time doing things that aren't really their core job. Fundamentally, the OT team and the process engineers are in, their job is to be able to execute that factory, to keep it running keep the machines working, produce the product that the company sells. What they're finding is that they spend a lot of time fighting fires, specifically with this integration piece. At the same time, a lot of reports have come out and said that the data scientists are spending far too much time looking for data and trying to massage the data and not enough time actually analyzing and utilizing that analysis so that they can improve the process of the, of the company. And the security teams have also been uh, challenged with this new approach. When we have data going everywhere to multiple different targets, they need to know what data is going where and why. And <clears throat> when it's all being custom coded and it's all being performed under the covers, if you will, that becomes very hard. And so they're saying, look, we need to be able to see this and visualize what data is going where and why so that we can identify um, security holes or security challenges and we can address them. 
We also need to be able to shut off integrations when they're no longer in use so that we're not continuing to feed data to a system. Could be a system within our company or could be a system with it outside of our company. So these are all the challenges that have occurred as people have attempted to perform these integrations, um, similar to what Matt had talked about. So when, when the HiBuy team started looking at this, we said, look, we're very familiar with industrial data and we're very familiar with IoT platforms and analytics. And how can we de develop a system that fixes these problems and that leverages the new technologies and new architectures that are coming to us from the IT world? So we created a list of requirements specifically around how do we integrate the an, an integration engine with modeling and conditioning and contextualization, recognizing that that's a key part of data integration. So the requirements list that we came up with were, number one, you need to be able to de deliver data to multiple applications in multiple levels. So you've got the edge, and there are edge analytics that some companies want to use, or even edge visualization capabilities that they want. You've also got um, your on-premises system. So we need to be able to deliver the data to an on-premise system that may be running locally and need to um, get access to that data. And then you've got the cloud and there's huge uses of the cloud and that's a great target and that's a great place to put it and it's got infinite scale, but it's not the only place for this data. At the same time of delivering the data, we also need to build a system that is, does not disrupt the existing automation infrastructure. <clears throat> the automation infrastructure in many companies has been put in place over many, many years, sometimes 20, 30, 40 years. And companies, if it's running and it's operating and it's producing product, they don't want to touch it and they don't want to imp impact it. So we need to sit beside that infrastructure and delicately interact with it the way that it's designed to be interacted with. We don't want to just wipe out our entire automation infrastructure, put in new just so that we can um, get data up into our new analytics system. At the same time, we don't want to rewrite all of the programs within our PLCs so that they can send data out over some IT protocol like MQTT and up into a cloud service. Process data is a little different than your typical analytic data. When you're pulling data out of a information system in a transaction system, say for marketing or, auto, or, uh, or sales purposes, you generally would pull that data daily or weekly or monthly and you would, analyze, you would process it and you would prepare it and then you would analyze it and then you would um, place it in, in the analytics or visualization package. With automation data, people are much more used to being able to see that data instantaneously. They want to be able to see what's going on on the factory floor right now, not what happened three days ago. They want to be able to run their edge analytic on data in real time. And, and when they think about real time, they're thinking either second data or even, even millisecond data, say 100 milliseconds. They want to get the data, process it, and then be able to respond immediately. So industrial data has different requirements when it comes to uh, the speed at which you process it. And what you need to do is be able to process it in motion, while it's in motion, before it's landed in the data lake or the database that it's going to. <clears throat> Another key part of industrial data is the scale and the scope of it. As we had talked about earlier, you know, there's, there's many different applications that the data needs to be sent to. But there's also a factory typically has hundreds or more PLCs and machine controllers. So many, many devices. All those devices have their own data structures and the way that they interact with, with uh, systems and applications. They also have many, many data points each. So you're dealing with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of data points. So when you design your system, you need to think about that scale. We can't take each data point and add multiple um, actions to it in order to get it from where it is today to where it's got to be, and then be able to scale that out over 100,000 lines. We need some way of doing that in a much more efficient manner. <clears throat> the, 
data update rates are, is also very important. <clears throat> we need to be able to update rates, as I had talked about earlier, it, at very high speeds for some systems, we also may have systems that require very low update rates. So maybe an analytic in the cloud wants data at once every 10 minutes, while an analytic at an edge system wants data every 100 milliseconds. So you need to be able to handle that. You need to be able to abstract. You don't want to send 100 millisecond data for 100,000 tags up into the cloud. That would get very expensive, and it's never going to be used. At the same time, you may need to provide that to a local analytic so that it can do its job. So it's really important to be able to segment that data and those data rates. And finally, of course, you need to be able to support both OT protocols and IT protocols because you know, this integration is really at the merger of OT and IT. So these requirements were what led us to, to drive and, and build the solution of the High Byte Intelligence Hub. We really, through our research, developed that list of requirements and then started building the hub. And the key part of the, the Intelligence Hub is that it combines two key concepts that Matt talked about and that I just talked about, which is you need to be able to model and contextualize and condition your data, and you need to be able to integrate it with your systems, and you need to combine those two concepts together into one solution. As you can see from the diagram, we took a hub and spoke approach to data integrations. This is different than the traditional um, ISA 95 model or Purdue model, where you've got a layered approach to data. That was the industry 3.0 view that I showed you earlier. The challenge with that view is as you scale up the data and you scale up the number of systems, you end up having a lot of data flowing through systems that will never be used by those systems and all it does is slow them down, clog them up and confuse things. While at the same time, you're not able to get at the information that you need. So with the hub and spoke, we're able to very cleanly identify where the data is going, why it's going there, how it's going and at what rate it's going, and the different systems can get access to data that they need. The other key thing about the High Byte Intelligence Hub is who it's being used by. So we had developed the Intelligence Hub not to sit in the cloud and used by the data scientists, but to sit at the edge or near to the edge on premises and be used by the data ops team, the team that understands the automation on the factory floor. They're the people that know that, that know what's going on in the factory, and they're the people that can respond as changes happen. So they, number one, can set up that integration initially, and number two, can, can respond as time goes on to how, um, <clears throat> as, as your systems change or as the industrial automation changes. So the integration hub, or the intelligence hub, I'm sorry, the hybrid intelligence hub is created based on three key concepts. Number one, we connect to systems. So it's designed to have multiple connections. In fact, many connections. We can connect to many different systems. Could be OPC servers, could be PLC supporting OPC, could be smart sensors, could be ERP systems or MES or SCADA. We connect to all of those. And after we establish a connection, we identify any inputs that are coming from them or any outputs that are going to them. So you build up those connections. We connect over OPC UA, which is the common OT protocol, and MQTT, which is often utilized in IT type systems. I noted on here that we're adding the ability to connect directly into databases because that's a feature that the team is working on right now and we expect to be in our next release. That'll allow us to contextualize data directly out of, you know, pull context out of an MES system, add it into the real-time data, and be able to deliver it to the analytic in a fully contextualized um, model, dynamically contextualized model. So the next piece of the intelligence hub is the ability to flow data. And this is critical. You've got your inputs, your outputs, but you need to be able to move the data. And like I had said earlier, you're not just moving the data, but you're moving the data at a very specific rate defined for that target application and for that target use case. And you're able to manage these flows in the system. So you can turn them on, you can evaluate what systems are getting this data so that I know that if I'm replacing a piece of equipment, I can easily identify the impact 
and I can adjust for it. And the last component at the center of the intelligence hub is our ability to model data. And this is what's critical, critical for the modeling, the contextualization, the, the conditioning of data. You need to be able to model, and it's not just about modeling your assets. You need to be able to model assets, products, and processes. Really, you can model anything you need. You could even model a system if that's what you want to be able to do. <clears throat> Once you establish your models, these are where we add the context, the normalization of the data, and the standardization of the data. So here are a few screenshots of the Hybrid Intelligence Hub. The configuration, this is the configuration here. The configuration runs within a browser. And similar to what I just talked about with the con connections, modeling, and flows, that's what we have, how we've structured the application as well. So you create connections, you identify your inputs and outputs, you then establish your standard models. You then use those models to create instances. So an instance would be an actual piece of equipment. So you may establish a model for a robotics arm for information going to an analytic. And then you create an instance for each robotic arm that's on your factory floor. And you define a series of properties for that model that you then tag to the actual data points coming into the intelligence hub. So then we can create a custom model that then gets um, sent to the flows and sent out to the analytic uh, system that requires it. So to understand why this whole contextualization piece is critical and modeling piece is critical, you have to understand what a typical um, industrial OPC view of data looks. <clears throat> It's not that this is OPC, but the OPC system mirrors the industrial automation on the factory floor. So in a typical work cell, you may have a PLC that's controlling the work cell, and you may also have a machine controller that's on a piece of equipment, the major piece of equipment in there. So here I've got a stamping machine with a, uh, a uh, machine controller, and I've got a PLC controlling the cell. I've got a series of tags. Now, in here, you can see these tags are not very understandable. And if you were to be able to see the data, the data would not be all that understandable either. It was really designed to optimize the PLC programming. Some PLCs provide a little bit more um, intuitively named uh, data tags, but this is pretty typical in an industrial environment. So the challenge is how do I get to the right where I've got actual data models for my machinery. And not only do I have one data model, but I've got two pieces of machinery. I have a common data model across them. So this model doesn't matter if the machinery was purchased from different vendors or purchased from at different times. I still get the same data when I look at that machinery. Here you can see I've been able to contextualize my data to standardize it and aggregate it and add context and normalization to it. So I'm able to add all this rich information directly into my models. Let me take you through a couple of use cases. So here you can see um, a very simple environment where I, I've got a number of devices on my factory floor. I need to get the data into the cloud and I need to use it, let's say an Azure instance, and I'm using the IoT hub. Well, you can install the intelligence hub on premise. You can model up your assets, run the data through, and send the data off to the cloud. And when it lands in the cloud, you're able to easily analyze it. And as you have multiple, hard, um, multiple assets, the data is going to look the same from one to the next, which makes it very easy for you to utilize. Another use case is I've got a corporate environment with multiple plants. Here I've got the Highbind Intelligence Hub installed in, these, in each of the multiple plants. So in this case, maybe you have a corporate team who provides technical support to those plants, and they've established a data lake in the cloud where they can analyze and monitor various assets, various processes, and <clears throat> products in the cloud. They don't want to be able to, they don't want to get all these different data points from all these different sites in to try to 
understand them, they can push down those models and then the site can do the mapping on, on premise. And not only that, the site can continue to run their unique systems because many times each site had selected a different system or may have implemented the this, this system differently. They can continue to run those local systems and run normally, but they are able to move the data up into the cloud and get the support that they get from the, hard, from the, um, from the corporate team. So if we combine these concepts of, of, of analyzing data and, and moving data into different applications, and you've got multiple applications, then you have what we call our unified namespace. In this case, we're able to take all of our assets, our processes, our products, and we're able to manage the delivery of that data to all these different systems. The whole key here is how do we reduce the time to implement in integrations and make sure that they're able to be maintained and that they're agile as time goes on? And how do we in improve the quality and security of the data? So in summary, the Hybrid Intelligence Hub was designed as a tool for the data ops team, the OT team who's focused on data ops to model, condition, and contextualize and integrate their systems. It provides a tool set designed specifically for them. It's a code-free tool set where you don't need to write custom scripts in order to move data around. You're able to maintain your integrations and have visibility into the data flows with the goal of being able to accelerate the deployments of your analytics and IoT systems and the integrations to all your legacy systems as well to improve the security and resiliency and really ultimately to be able to deliver the value, the business value to these IT systems that was often expected but has been very hard to achieve. So at this point, I guess we're going to move into questions, but I would just say to everyone, the Highbyte website is a great source of information for additional information. And on that set, on the website, you can also schedule a demonstration and presentation where we can get much deeper into what your business needs are and how the solution works. You can also sign up for a free trial if you'd like to try out the software. Tori, I think hey. I'd turn it over to you at this point. Yeah, I want to um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's a few minutes past the hour now. So we'll answer some questions live. And then um, for others of you, uh, we'll, we'll follow up with you with direct email communication after this. Um, I have a question. I think it will be best directed to Matt. Um, do IX leaders say they're making higher investments than followers because they want to or because they have the budget to do so. So if I'm kind of reading into that question, I'm thinking, is it because, you know, the, the leaders are actually just larger companies with, with deeper pockets? That's a good question. I haven't looked at it by company size. Um, you know, I, I do see, um, we did do some research on budgets, so, so we have some insights there. Um, you, you know, the piloting budgets, and again, this is bigger companies, billion dollars and above, you know, often we'll see two, three million dollar piloting budget somewhere in there, sometimes a little bit more uh, to test different technologies. When they start thinking about big bets, uh, I, I hear that term big bets a lot, usually it's about 10x type things. I hear 10x a lot, so somebody might be investing 30 million to get 300 million. Uh, so there is a difference by company size, right? You're not going to save $300 million if you're a $300 million company, that's for sure. Uh, but I think the ratio is about work. Um, one important insight on budgets, the leaders do um, co-budgets, uh, co co-funding co, uh, co models. So yeah, the, the, typically that um, pilot is funded by the corporate, but then the leaders continue on and they don't fully fund for the business, but they partially fund for the business to give some added incentive for the business to invest. So that co-funding co mo co model uh, seems to be very helpful as well. Great. Um, I, this question came in. Um, this might be one that you want to take a swing at, John. Um, you know, you talked a lot today about um, protocol and um, other API standards. Do you think data models will have some sort of standard? Um, you know, for example, like an analog data model, pressure data model, et cetera. Um, to kind of promote this free share of data. Can you speak a little bit to that? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And there's actually a number of groups. A lot of the um, different industry groups are starting to define common semantic data models for their, um, for their specific industry. Uh, so we do see that and we, we see those data models coming out and, and we think that the, with the intelligence hub, you can actually implement a lot of those different data models that have been identified or created and apply them to your existing equipment. One of the challenges that a lot of companies have is an industry group comes out with a new data model for, for their industry. But now if they've got equipment that's 20 years old, it's going to take them you know, many, many years in order to fully implement that data model by waiting if they just wait until they go through the normal replacement cycle. So we're able to implement a lot of these different data models. In fact, you could have multiple models, some one model for your building maintenance and another model for your, your assets. So we do see a lot of activity on, on the uh, data model side and, and we think it's all great because it, it will definitely accelerate the deployment of these systems. Great. I have one more question and um, I think it, it, it will be posed well to both of you. And that is, um, what are the most compelling and common business drivers um, driving, you know, industrial transformation, um, the use of, of, of data ops to accomplish IX? Um, you know, is it productivity? Is it lower costs? And um, is there something that they're missing and that companies should be prioritizing today and are not? Well, if you don't mind, John, I'll go first, save the, uh, save the last word for you so you can wrap it up. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you, you know, going back a few months uh, or years, I would say cost. We heard cost uh, quite a bit around transformation. All right, it's easy to measure, easy to get started with. Uh, I really hope it's not just all about costs, right, for companies. If, if this whole thing, which we spent, you know, the better part of a decade on, is just another cost saving measure, I think we, we missed an opportunity. Uh, some of the forward thinking companies were, were definitely looking at productivity and the workforce, the next generation industrial workforce in the US, Europe, and other locations, um, and how to upskill, how to create knowledge workers in our industry. Uh, and I think that's really important and inspiring. And the more advanced companies are also looking towards how transparency uh, and uh, accountability can drive culture change, but then also connection to the customer uh, and new business models. So that's, that's an angle as well. And finally, really, I know we mentioned it earlier, but when it comes to, to COVID-19, you, you, uh, you can't not talk about that at an event like uh, at this time in history. And so that, that whole, the connected worker, remote collaboration, um, new, more flexible uh, operating models, I think we're gonna see, depending on the industry, uh, you know, real acceleration, right? And it's gonna be more than just you know, Zoom in a factory, right? It's gonna be really thinking about how to, to, to approach these things differently given some constraints we have coming. Yeah, great, great points, Matt. Um, I may end up saying similar things, but with very different words. Um, when well, I think about, I didn't mean to steal your your thunder. Sorry. No, it's no, it's 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 it's. I agree. Um, when I think about it, I think the first use cases that a lot of people were going after was was asset maintenance and how can we uh, maintain our assets, keep them healthy longer, reduce the cost of assets. Um, the nice thing about assets is that they're very constrained. It's very clear where they are, what the data is, what's going on. Uh, the next steps are moving beyond assets into much more dynamic environments, which is like a line. How do we optimize a line? How do we make it run? Should we be running it faster or slower? And should we be, you know, what components are our bottlenecks and doing much more deeper research of um, the entire plant or the entire factory or the entire company? And, these are much more dynamic environments. So as the technology gets better, we're seeing a broader use of it. And um, you know, to Matt's point, when you're talking about asset maintenance, it's often talking about reducing cost. But as we move into analyzing a line, it's about how do we get more agile? How do we get more products through? How do we drive um, the agility of the business, more custom products? So, I think that's a lot of where, where the excitement is and where people want to get to. Um, and I also agree with Matt on the whole, you know, the virus and how that's affecting things. One thing that, that we've heard for many years is that there have been a few industries that have been able to have 
experts at a corporate headquarters who are supporting field operations. And so they've been able to, um, like in the oil and gas, they've had core, they would like to have core experts in their headquarters in Houston while people are on the rig or the rig automation is running and they don't have to put them in harm's way. So how do we improve the safety of humans while still being productive and even improving our productivity? So figuring out, and I think this whole virus thing has, has moved, the, uh, moved the bar on how can people interact and, and people are really starting to think broader in terms of how can I interact with my equipment? How can I interact with my facility? How can I interact with other people within my company who are remote so that I can get the best people working on the jobs that need to be working on that job and I don't need to be flying them all over and putting them in harm's way. So I think it goes back to, you know, the ultimate is uh, starts with cost, then it's increased, um, sales or revenue, and then it's increased safety. That's great. Thank you, Matt and John. Um, big thanks to, to our two speakers today for all of the thought and experience. Um, really great content you shared today. And of course, thank you to everyone that tuned in for today's webinar. Uh, we will be sending you the recording as well as the research spotlight from LNS Research that dives deeper into some of these topics and shares more uh, statistics um, on, on what they've learned and uncovered from companies over the last few months. So thanks again for everyone for joining and thank you, Matt and, and John for sharing this information with us today. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Matt. Great, great webinar. Thank you. Bye.